Hello, thank you for joining us today. My name is Risa Sales and I am the Vice President, Senior Account Executive and Regional Project Lead at BOK Financial Insurance. We are happy to share a webinar with you on the Coronavirus Response Act and employee benefits. The webinar will be presented by Stacey Barrow from Marathas Barrow Weatherhead Lent. Your BOK Financial Insurance team is here to help you navigate these unprecedented times. Please feel free to reach out to your service team with any questions that you may have. I'd like to transfer it over to Stacy now. Thanks, Risa, and uh, thank you everybody for joining. Um, definitely an important webinar. We have a lot to cover. Um, We'll jump right into it. Uh, very, you know, start with a very brief background, and I'll share with you um, a little bit of what we've seen from an employer response out there. Um, we'll talk about uh, what the federal government has done, at least initially, uh, prior to some of the larger legislation passed by Congress, like the Families First Coronavirus Response Act. Um, and then we'll we'll focus in on the uh, FFCRA, um, in particular the two leave provisions um, that are are really relevant right now. Um, and then we'll also talk about some common employee benefits issues uh, and employment issues that can arise um, during these these pandemic situations. So um, the virus itself is a version of SARS, apparently, and the disease aspect of it is the COVID-19 part. Um, it seems that it, you know, we all, it all took us largely by surprise, and it wasn't until the end of January where the World Health Organization started to declare it a public health emergency. Um, our Health and Human Services Organization responded the day after that. And it wasn't even until mid-February before they started characterizing this as COVID-19. And that, that term was barely uh, coined until late February. It became a pandemic in early March. We declared it such uh, in the U.S. And, um, you know, since that time, um, you know, it started out, there were about 2,000 cases in the U.S. It was all over the country. But you can see that number now. We are, we'll, we'll be near that many fatalities with, with before too long. And the number of cases is now in every state and every territory um, and uh, probably have 50,000 plus cases at the time of, of this recording. Um, the uh, illnesses range from uh, many of them are very mild. Um, some people um, test positive for it that have no symptoms even. Um, it can be also very severe, including uh, illness up to you know, death. Um, most symptoms appear within two to 14 days, although we're hearing that um, it can take as long as a month to manifest. And although um, most folks who get it apparently will experience it um, in a relatively mild manner, um, nearly 40% of people that were sick enough to be hospitalized were younger, were age 20 to 54. Um, and of course, older people with the chronic health conditions are at much higher risk of uh, developing um, a serious illness in relation to, to COVID-19. And of course, it spreads very easily from person to person and can stick to hard and soft surfaces for days. Um, they don't expect, <clears throat> pardon me, a viable vaccine um, earlier than 2021. Um, We've all heard of the uh, preventive measures to take, social distancing to reduce contact with people. Schools and workplaces have been closed. Large gatherings are, are canceled. Um, folks in, in many areas are being asked to self-quarantine. Um, we have it uh, right now uh, in Massachusetts um, where we are. Um, we've seen employers um, obviously start educating employees on COVID-19, helping them with prevention. Um, and other techniques to reduce the spread. Um, you know, early action include enforcing stay-at-home policies if employees are sick or symptomatic. And at this point, I think most employers are having employees work from home until further notice unless they're essential workers in, in an essential industry. Uh, when you're doing this, uh, when you're having more employees work from home, we want to make sure they have the proper technology that it's secured properly. 
and that some employees may actually like going into work. They may feel isolated. Uh, it's up to management to keep things lively. You might consider something like uh, having more frequent video conferences and just doing things to keep people engaged as a team. Uh, we've seen a lot of businesses take action, uh, screening visitors, um, including employers with employees, uh, if they've returned from certain listed countries, um, if they've been in contact with someone who has cured for someone with COVID-19, if they have any COVID-related symptoms, they've just, you know, they've been denying entry, told to, to, to go home. The federal government, um, prior to the FFCRA and, and the next round of legislation that'll probably be signed into law within the next 48 hours, um, the federal government, uh, through its, its uh, agencies, the, the big three that we deal with, IRS, Health and Human Services, and Department of Labor, um, released guidance for employers or, or kind of reissued guidance for employers as it relates to uh, pandemic-related um, issues. First piece was an IRS notice just making it clear that um, any treatment or testing for COVID-19 can be provided under a high deductible health plan without worry as to whether the plan will remain HSA qualified. Um, all the other regular traditional HSA requirements remain in place and employers, whether you're sponsoring high deductible plans or otherwise, should you know, determine, and you can talk with your BOK uh, broker consultant about that, um, but how um, the carriers are going to provide benefits for treatment of COVID-19, including whether there's any cost sharing. I think there'll be probably a lot of carriers that provide treatment without participant cost sharing. Um, I know many states are encouraging it. Um, some states may even require it ultimately. Um, the next round of, of federal guidance um, that we'd like to see, we're likely to see that, that CARES Act um, will probably contain some additional guidance on telehealth, um, just clearing up um, you know, how it can be used in connection um, with, uh, with, with COVID-19. Um, IRS also issued um, a couple of notices regarding tax relief where they are delaying uh, the tax return due dates and obviously payment dates from April 15th through July 15th. Um, the IRS has determined that anyone uh, that has a tax payment due or that needs to file a, re a return is an affected individual by the COVID-19 emergency. So they're, you know, they're extending it to everybody um, in the U.S. and <clears throat> that provides employers a little bit more time to make some of their tax payments as well. So it's geared to um, allow employers to, to help employers um, retain more money to pay to employees to keep the doors open, um, so to speak, um, and keep the, uh, the, the wages flowing until we get the next round of relief. The IRS relief, um, they did say it's solely with respect to federal income tax returns not to any other type of information return like ACA forms. So at least until further notice, we should still try to get those forms in by the end of March. Although of course, if your business is closed and told to stay home, um, you'll, you'll certainly have a, uh, a good reasonable cost statement you'd be able to file if they, um, if you were to hear from them. I think they are, are gonna provide some leeway here in terms of timeliness. Um, issues, but um, at least as stated, do your best to get those forms in. If you think there's going to be an issue, you can get an automatic 30-day extension by completing Form 8809. Um, CMS reminded employers, uh, if you're in the small group market, that um, the essential health benefit package, which is something that's included in all small group plans, will provide coverage for diagnosis and treatment of COVID-19. And of course, the exact details behind that in terms of what's the participant cost sharing gonna look like um, will vary plan to plan. Um, and, and there may be prior authorizations um, for, for some services. Um, all plans are required to provide free testing 
for COVID-19 um, without prior authorization under the Coronavirus Response Act. We'll talk more about that in a little bit. That is um, going to be a more limited uh, time frame. And of course, many states are encouraging carriers to cover all kinds of COVID-related items and services, including treatment without cost sharing. Probably a good thing for everyone. And uh, this is what reserves are for. This is why insurance companies are required to have reserves. Um, they should uh, be, be okay and have plenty of gas in the tank. Um, CMS also reminds us that if you're quarantining outside of a hospital setting, you're, you're staying at home, sheltering at home, that's not a medical benefit. Um, if you are, of course, um, receiving home health care, that can be covered, but just generally staying at home by itself is not a medical benefit. Um, and when a COVID-19 uh, vaccine comes into fruition, eventually is developed, um, it will eventually be covered under the ACA's um, recommended preventive care services um, and as, as an essential health benefit as well. Um, plans will have a certain period of time to um, abide by the recommended preventive care listings the have to the first plan year beginning 12 months after the recommendation is issued. But of course, we expect that plans will um, uh, provide you know these this kind of you know provide the COVID-19 vaccine uh, without cost sharing you know or much uh, you know, as soon as it's available uh, they're not going to wait until the government um, deadline passes. So moving on now to the ADA just another kind of reminder of the, the Americans with Disabilities Act the way this law generally works is that it prohibits employers from requiring medical exams of employees or making disability related inquiries unless they're job related um, or they're part of uh, something like a voluntary wellness program. So you generally can't require employees to have medical exams or respond to disability related inquiries unless it's job related. But when you have a situation like a pandemic, as determined by the World Health Organization and the CDC, you can take certain actions as an employer without violating the ADA. Um, when you have, um, you know, when you realize that you know the pandemic is becoming more severe based on the assessment of public health uh, officials, you can kind of objectively determine that employees will face a direct threat if they contract the virus. And so then you can make disability related inquiries, um, even of asymptomatic employees. You know, take temperature, that kind of thing, ask them questions, uh, are they, do they feel ill, um, make them call in sick if they're experiencing flu like symptoms. Um, you can send them home, obviously, um, if they display those kinds of symptoms, if you're, if you're, you know, an essential business that's still open at this time. Um, any information that you obtain from an employee, like I, you know, I've been exposed or, you know, I, I've tested positive for it, it is confidential medical information under the ADA. We'll talk in a little bit what you can do with that information. There are certain exceptions that apply. And basically, you can tell employees without disclosing the name of the affected individual. And again, I'll, I'll cover that um, in a little bit. So. Um, you can obviously require employees to engage in all kinds of good infection control practices, wear protective equipment. Um, when employees uh, return from a pandemic, uh, if they were asymptomatic, um, the CDC is generally recommending against requiring a doctor's note. It just kind of clogs up the system. Um, probably within your rights to request one um, when uh, the employee has tested positive previously and when they're before they're ready to return to work. Um, but in the general course, they're they're saying um, don't require a doctor's note if it was just someone who was sheltering in place. Uh, Department of Labor released an FAQ reminding employers that are subject to FMLA that um, you know, when an employee is 
out for his own serious health condition or to care for a family member with a serious health condition, they're entitled to FMLA leave under certain circumstances. Um, and now um, there's an expanded FMLA we'll, we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, the traditional FMLA, though, is really more for folks with serious health conditions. So that would be um, a diagnosis of COVID-19, you know, out for that reason, you'd obviously get the traditional FMLA as well. An employee who is out just for the purposes of avoiding exposure to COVID-19, um, just for that reason alone, so that doesn't, doesn't want to get exposed, is not protected under the traditional FMLA or the new expanded FMLA. Um, there are there is an avenue for payment under the emergency paid sick leave, um, but as you'll see when we talk about the expanded FMLA, it is fairly limited, and it's only in situations where the employee can't work because they have to they they have to care for a child whose daycare provider or school is closed due to COVID-19 related issues. So we'll turn to that now, basically. So um, earlier this month. Uh, Congress passed the Families First Coronavirus Response Act, the FFCRA. Um, it was effective largely immediately, although there were some paid uh, sick leave provisions that are effective now as of April 1st. But this includes, um, again, two paid sick leave provisions, free testing for coronavirus, meaning no, no cost sharing for individuals, um, increased funding for the states for unemployment assistance, food aid, and the Medicaid. Um, I think one thing we may see is that the states who did not expand Medicaid yet uh, after the ACA, I think we'll see more of them expanding Medicaid to uh, take advantage of some of the federal funds to, to help out with the corona relief. So two um, main provisions are the emergency paid sick leave and emergency FMLA provisions. Um, these apply to employers with less than 500 employees and public employers of any size, although there are exceptions for small employers under 50, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a second. Um, the, um, the leave provisions are effective just for the rest of the year, starting April 1st through the end of, of 2020, unless they are extended uh, by, by Congress or by regulation. Um, employers who are paying out this paid sick leave or emergency FMLA leave are, uh, are eligible for a refundable payroll tax credit to help the employer come up with the cash to make these payments. Uh, this is good news for nonprofits they wouldn't benefit from an income tax credit, but they can take advantage of a refundable payroll tax credit. So they'll be treated the same as um, employers, uh, for-profit employers in this regard. And there's also a tax credit available for health insurance premiums um, that are fairly allocable to the sick leave payments. If you're paying employees sick leave um, and you're keeping their insurance in place, um, you can also get some tax credit help. Um, this will be further fleshed out in IRS regulations, and we expect those to be released um, fairly soon. Um, I'll get more into the, the paid leave in a second, but just to kind of cover the, the testing in a little more detail. So from now through the end of the public health emergency, as declared by Health and Human Services, all group health plans, fully insured and self-funded, including grandfathered plans, as well as um, uh, individual market plans, must provide the COVID-19 testing with no cost sharing from the participant or prior authorization requirements. Um, this includes services for urgent care, emergency room, or provider visits that result in um, the administration of a COVID-19 test. This is temporary, but all plans will be covering this for participants. Uh, we do, we have heard that there's a national shortage of COVID-19 lab testing materials and that the testing is generally going to be limited to those who meet certain criteria. 
um, and were referred by a physician. Um, we're hearing that uh, if, you're, if you have symptoms, you're urged to stay home and contact doctors by phone rather than just showing up at a medical facility um, and asking to be tested. So in terms of the two paid leave divisions in the FFCRA, um, this is the first one I'm going to go through. And um, in a sense, this is kind of, I think, viewed as the first one of the two that would be used in any pandemic situation. And this is the emergency paid sick leave. And so this is when the, emer the, the, um, the employee cannot work either at the location or work remotely because the employee is subject to, and I'll just kind of go through them for a second, is subject to federal, state, or local quarantine or isolation order related to COVID-19. So this, as you can see, doesn't require the employee to be symptomatic. This is just that you know, this one is saying the employee is told to stay home. He can't work, but he's told to stay home due to a federal, state, or local quarantine order. So I think those stay-at-home orders that we're seeing around the country if you're subject to one of them and you can't work and you can't work from home and you're not an essential employee, you're not going in, I think that's covered under number one here. Separately, if you've been told by a provider, healthcare provider, to self-quarantine because of concerns like you've been exposed, that would also qualify. Um, if you are symptomatic and you're seeking a medical diagnosis, that would also qualify. Then there are three others there's four and five where the employee is caring for someone else. Um, you're caring for someone who's subject to a quarantine or isolation order. And then five, caring for a child if the school or daycare center has been closed or the child care provider is unavailable due to COVID-19 precautions. Now, remember that number five there because that is the only trigger for a payment under the new FMLA leave, it's just number five. It's going to be basically a continuation of number five. Number six is that if the employee is experiencing any other similar condition specified by the federal agency, so this is kind of like a, a catch-all to be determined, so we don't, you know, get caught so unaware next time. So the entitlement here is the employees can be entitled to up to 80 hours of paid sick leave, and then that amount is prorated for part-time employees, generally based on what they're expected to work over a two-week period. If their hours vary, you can measure them over the last six months. Um, all employees are immediately eligible for this leave. There's no minimum um, you know, work requirement. You don't have to have worked for your employer for 30 days or six months or a year you're immediately entitled to this leave. The amount of the leave is paid at the employee's regular rate of pay up to $511 per day, $5,110 in the aggregate when leave is taken due to an employee's own illness or quarantine and paid at two-thirds of the regular rate up to $200 a day, thousand in the aggregate when the leave is taken to care for others or for number six. Uh, we talked about that catch-all. So it's paid a little differently depending on whether it's for the employee or for someone else. Um, there are, of course, anti-retaliation provisions. Um, you can't change your paid leave policies to disadvantage employees, um, those kinds of things. So that's the emergency paid sick leave. I'll get into the exceptions in a second, but I want to talk about the emergency FMLA provision, and so this is an expansion of FMLA, adding another or an additional um, reason for FMLA, and it's it's really a continuation of the payment under number five uh, on the paid sick leave page, uh, one prior. So the way this works is that FMLA is amended to provide 12 weeks of job-protected leave for a need related to a public health emergency to any employee who's been employed for at least 30 days. And so the qualifying need here is when the employee can't work or work from home because the child's school or place of care has been closed or the provider's unavailable due to a public health emergency. 
So, or, you know, COVID-19. So essentially this is, there's only one way to, um, uh, to be entitled to a benefit under the expanded FMLA. It's really just this one need related to caring for a child. There's a 10 day elimination period, which would be paid under the emergency paid sick leave provision. And then the rest of the 12 week period, which will be 10 weeks, will be paid at two thirds of the employee's regular rate, because again, it's paid um, based on the employee caring for someone else. So it's at that reduced two third rate um, based on their normally scheduled hours, capped at $200 a day and $10,000 in total. So um, $12,000 total benefit um, if the employee is caring for, for someone else. Um, the employees um, may, but cannot be required to use paid leave during the elimination period. But generally, they're going to be um, taking uh, the um, the paid sick leave, and they could then supplement that um, if it's a two-third payment with other paid leave. So there are exceptions for employers with less than 50 employees um, if the if providing the required leave would jeopardize the viability of their business as an ongoing concern. And the, the Department of Labor is going to issue further guidance on the exception. Um, right now, it's kind of a, a good faith compliance rule, but they're probably going to be fairly rigorous with the exception. You really want to want to know, you know, it, you know, did it jeopardize the viability of your business to provide this leave, or you know, did you just not want to provide the leave to the employee? Um, so it might might be a high bar, but for now, you know, it's it's good faith compliance. Um, there's an exception to the reinstatement requirement um, under FMLA if you have less than 25 employees if the position simply been eliminated um, after the pandemic ends. Um, and you can also exclude employees who are healthcare providers or emergency responders from these paid leave requirements. Um, there'll be more guidance on that and you should talk to counsel um, if you do have employees um, who are, are looking to utilize that leave and, and, and you kind of consider them in the, the first responder category. So, Turning to COVID-19 and employee benefits, um, some of the questions we get um, involve uh, the question of whether information is, is private and is it subject to HIPAA. And when you receive information from an employee that they have been exposed to HIPAA, uh, to exposed to HIPAA, they've been exposed to COVID-19, um, you know, they, they have been diagnosed with, say, a positive test for COVID-19, talk about what to do after. But that information by itself is not subject to HIPAA. It's not treated, maintained, or received by a covered entity. The employer is not getting it from its group health plan, but it is confidential information under the ADA, the Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, even if it's not Subject to HIPAA, though, again, we want to treat it as sensitive personal information. There are restrictions as to how we can use it under the ADA. I'll cover those in a second. But the point here is that, um, you know, the uh, that information, if the employee says, look, I'm, I'm self-quarantining for 14 days because of exposure to the virus, that's not HIPAA-covered information. Um, employees can stop their dependent care FSA elections. Um, due to school closures um, and daycare center closings. Um, th these are permissible changes under the change in status rules. Um, typically, FSA elections are irrevocable, but when there's a change in cost or coverage, you can make an election change here, and so you can certainly stop your dependent care FSA election. Um, <clears throat> likewise, an employee could increase his, uh, his dependent care FSA election if he has to hire a nanny now because he and his spouse are working from home and they need someone to watch the kids so that they can continue to work. That would also be permissible. Um, the change in cost or coverage rules only apply to dependent care FSAs. They don't apply to health care FSAs. Um, so no changes would be permitted under a health FSA if the employee is continuing to work and continuing to be paid. 
So if employees are furloughed, you got to review your plan documents to determine whether they have to be put on COBRA or if there's an extension of benefits available, and if so, for how long. Um, it's going to be very fact-specific. It's going to depend on the terms of your plan. Um, you know, generally speaking, between furloughs and, and layoffs, there's there's somewhat of a difference. It's it's usually just with regard to benefits. Um, furlough is is basically short of a layoff. Um, you're expecting employees to return. You're trying to keep the benefits in place. A layoff is a job termination, and any crew leave is going to get paid out. And then I really just treat it like a traditional employment termination. Um, COBRA is offered either when employment is terminated or the benefits are terminated because of the reduction in hours. Um, so assuming you're maintaining the group health plan still, if employees lose coverage because their hours are reduced, that would be a COBRA event. Um, we're hearing that most carriers are allowing coverage to continue during the pandemic as long as the premiums are paid. Um, you know, talk to your BOK benefit consultant and they'll confirm what your specific carriers are doing, but um, I don't think that uh, they they want datelines showing up because they were canceling coverage during a pandemic. Uh, but you, you should definitely confirm, but uh, I, I think most carriers are, are uh, being accommodating at this time. Um, employees usually lose eligibility for benefits upon termination. Um, and if they're not expected to be rehired during a furlough, they probably lose benefits as well. It's usually one of the conditions for maintaining benefits um, under the terms of the plan. Um, employee contributions during leave, employers can either waive the contributions during leave and then catch up pre-tax when employees get back. They could have employees, um, if they're not being paid, to remit their share after tax to keep benefits afloat. They're, they're certainly free to cover um, you know, all or part of the cost of coverage. You know, they're, they're free to continue making their regular employer contribution and then have employees just pay their share if that's a possibility. Um, employment issues, are you required to pay employees out on leave? I mean, the general rule is that for hourly employees, if it's not protected leave, um, like we talked about, then um, you're not. Um, salaried employees, you're required to pay them if they're working um, at, at any point during the week. You got to pay them for the week. You want to make sure your salaried employees maintain their um, exempt status as well. Um, you need to be cautious and talk with employment counsel if you're going to be reducing hours and wages for salaried employees. Um, can we tell employees if a coworker has COVID-19 or suspects they've been exposed? And what do we do if an employee informs us that they've been exposed or they've tested positive for, for COVID-19? So certainly shut down that office or that area where that person was clean and sanitize everything and identify all of the coworkers who may have been exposed. Um, you'll want to inform them without identifying the employee unless the employee specifically consents. Um, and then recommend that they talk with a healthcare provider and self quarantine for at least 14 days. That's now a requirement by the CDC. Um, the employee who's affected, say you have someone in the office or the facility who's identified as, um, as being tested positive, they may want you to share the information with their coworkers so that people know if they haven't come into contact with them that. You know, they can kind of take that information into account when determining, you know, their their next steps as well. So you may have employees who are willing to share that information. If they are, that's fine. Otherwise, you should do your best to keep it confidential. Um, and there are even some exceptions there. So that ends my prepared um, remarks here. Uh, thank you for joining. Uh, we'll have more to come as the next round of relief passes and uh, we'll all get through this together. Thanks.